excited now to introduce our next speaker, Cedric Onnet. Uh, Cedric is a PhD student in HCI with a focus on wearable sensing and digital fabrication. With a background in embedded systems, he has been exploring the connections between physical computing, interactivity, and the arts by traveling the world of research labs and hackerspaces. Before his PhD, he worked for a few years as a firmware engineer and an inter-hacktivist in, silico in Silicon Valley co-founded a couple of companies creating tangible interfaces and interactive systems worldwide. He's developed e-textile music controllers, augmented immersive systems, interactive art pieces, modular implants, 3D positioning systems, among other open source projects. Thank you so much. I'm going to juggle between two screens. Let's see if it works. So my name is Cedric Honet. I am a PhD student in human-computer interaction. And I'm going to talk about a speculative question. What if we could miniaturize electronics so that it fits inside what I call fibers? So I know some textile people here will probably yell when they see the actual fiber. But I will show you, and I'd love to hear your feedback. So this is, yeah, this is very much in progress. Um, and I didn't announce that on the official uh, declaration of what I'm going to present, but there's something really important that I want to talk about. I've been exploring uh, Shenzhen to try to make my work and help people make their work as affordable and as uh, scalable as possible. So I will talk a little bit about that and all of the amazing ecosystem that I found on the way and all of the uh, yeah, mad events and art um, things that happened there. Um, and I, I started a, I co started a symposium there that uh, I would love uh, to have many of you uh, visit. So let's talk about these fiber circuits first. So I would like to know what you in the audience feel when you see this. How thick do you think the flexible PCB is? One and a. Nice. I, I can hear some people. So it's exactly between one and two. Uh, so this one is one millimeter wide, because it's the one millimeter addressable LED. And this one is 1.5. So the idea is that I'm trying to integrate it inside knitted, woven, um, embroidered uh, devices, so it can be for uh, the safety kind of glove that um, uh, beanie that we just saw, or the gloves that we see here that are controlling um, virtual reality. So there's two accelerometers and a magnetometer uh, embedded in the fiber. And the inspiration comes from this researcher called Mark Weiser, who coined the, the, term, the term ubiquitous computing. And he suggested that uh, technology that disappears and get woven into the fabric of life um, should be at some point there. And I took it very seriously. Um, and for my PhD, I'm proposing that those rigid interfaces, like our phones, uh, laptops, and so on, they don't have to stay there. And I think they can disappear eventually. And I think we will still have clothes in the future. <laughs> Just guessing. So there is a lot of really cool uh, wearable prototyping platforms, and um, I love them definitely for prototyping. But they're not exactly the most conformable. And on the other side, there is uh, pretty serious research. Um, this, this is from a group called Fibers at MIT. They basically use the manufacturing process for um, optical fibers, and they melt it, and they add some intelligence inside, can be semiconductors, can be uh, sensors, and so on. The problem is that those machines are not exactly as accessible and customizable and affordable as uh, we would like. So I'm proposing a, a solution. And 
the inspiration comes from this LED filament that probably some of you have seen. Um, they are in LED bulbs that look like they are incandescent. And the intuition is that this um, fabrication process, basically it's a flex PCB with silicone around. Um, this process, we can uh, replicate it and leverage the already existing high density electronics manufacturing uh, that exists for phones and some laptops and tabs. And we can prototype and we can also scale it to make things affordable. So I'm going to talk about how we go from intuition to reality. And this process is kind of summarized in this um, design space uh, that explains roughly what is the structure, uh, what is the processing that we can integrate in that kind of fiber, what kind of sensing and actuation, and how do we integrate it inside textiles, ideally inside fibers. So all of this is on GitHub, um, if ever, uh, uh, you'll see the, the link later, if ever you want to make your own. Um, so on GitHub, there's also a video that, that gives all sorts of tips to kind of um, help with all the problems we all had uh, with the supply chain during COVID, all the processors that were not available and so on. And there's also some tips to find things that are more affordable, like LCIC, um, how to find your prototype board and so on. In my case, I was mostly limited by the size of the microcontroller. So the green one here is 1.4 millimeter wide, and it's an STM32, um, which is interesting because you can port Arduino to that microcontroller. It's not too much work. Uh, I did it, took a couple of weeks, and now the official ST uh, Arduino people maintain it because it was merged. So now that we can uh, develop firmware easily, um, you can basically uh, program it like if it was a normal Arduino board, and you can develop using the classic um, traditional development board uh, fairly quickly, thanks to the Arduino environment. And so here I'm showing a couple of accelerometers and magnetometers, and now that we have validated the system, uh, we can um, design our PCB, so this is KiCad. Uh, it's a pretty simple one. There's a a microcontroller at the bottom, a couple of accelerometers on the right, um, magnetometer on the top, uh, capacitive sensing, and it looks like this. It's a, just a pretty long strip, uh, 20 centimeters. I don't know, inches, I'm sorry. Uh, 12, something like 15 inches, I guess. And if you zoom on it, the microcontroller is a little bit um, tricky because uh, the traces to connect inside are roughly the size of a hair. Um, the, the yellow surrounded trace is 50 microns or two mil. And those of you who make PCBs might know that many manufacturers don't really like uh, this kind of constraints and even less when it's a flexible PCB. So there's a couple of alternatives. You can uh, place a VR inside the pads of the microcontroller and it costs a little bit of money but you can kind of dilute it if you make more uh, bigger quantities. So if you look at the microscope, um, this kind of reveals the tiny imprecisions that become actually um, problematic sometimes. And we're going to see a bit later that um, I had to, to fight a little bit of some of them. So that was the processor and sensing fiber. And now I'm going to talk a bit about the LED fibers, which enable, enables uh, displaying information if you make a matrix of LEDs. Uh, but there's a need of generating a PCB that's as long as I want, maybe one meter, maybe 50 centimeters. And we can do that with the panel uh, fabrication tool in KiCad and most um, PCB tools. Uh, but you can also programming, uh, use a programming um, frameworks like SVG PCB, which is demonstrated upstairs. Um, you can talk with Leo, who's somewhere here. Um, and you can uh, make those very easily for prototyping. That's how actually how I started my uh, prototypes. So now that we have um, a design that seems to work, uh, we can make, make it with a laser. Uh, some of you might use already fiber lasers to engrave their PCBs. This one is practical because you have, I mean, the laser is very um, thin and you can actually make those uh, 50 micron traces. And then you can bake it. Uh, and then you can blink it. Then you might want to do 
uh, bit more and get people who actually make PCBs well, uh, better than me at least. And so this was made um, in a um, company in China. And I will talk a little bit more about that. But let's make these circuits actually uh, look like fibers. So to make them robust, I used a silicone coating that make them also uh, waterproof. And braiding, uh, which is um, interesting because it makes it more, even more robust, but also it, it feels more like a textile. And that's kind of the, the purpose of the project. So you can insert it by hand. I can buy those um, thing, the braiding by hand, or you can make a machine, or you can go to a manufacturer who will do it for you. On the silicone side, uh, sorry, you can also use uh, a manufacturer to do it, or you can do it by hand uh, by just silicone. Uh, di uh, sorry, deep coating. And now we can ask the question, is it robust? So, well, I, I'm lucky enough to have access to these kind of fancy machines. And I got uh, the chance to test how strong they are, um, how many times we can uh, bend them until they break. And so basically they can with, uh, withstand about the weight of two soda cans. And if you bend them, uh, 10,000 times, they don't even break. Um, this is just increasing a little bit the, the resistance of the connective traces, but it's still pretty good. Now, about integration, uh, we can use embroidery in situ like this one, or we can uh, integrate it by hand later to change the PCB if we want, or we can knit it or weave it, which is kind of inlay by construct. And we can then uh, make these wearables that can be used for uh, visualization of the data. So this was Unity, uh, and now this is Open Frameworks. Um, all of this is on GitHub again. So there is a couple of uh, parts that of this project. This is kind of the foundation of my PhD, and there are a couple of parts that are missing. Uh, I want to power those devices, and I'm looking into uh, printing photovoltaic textiles uh, using um, of the shelves, kind of a big word, but existing uh, printers by just changing the, the cartridges. Uh, I'm looking at miniaturizing a little more. Uh, if you look inside your NeoPixel LEDs, there's a tiny processor that you can actually get if you ask nicely. Uh, I got the chance to visit the factory that makes those NeoPixels, worth semiconductors, and got a few. And I got to play in my lab with some fancy machines that enable this um, wire bonding, uh, which is basically soldering with micrometer kind of dimensions. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you want to make it uh, mass manufactured, it's also possible, but costs a bit of money. Um, on a concrete kind of application side, uh, I have this selfish idea in mind, which is uh, basically making a, a microphone array to help um, for directional hearing aids. Um, because when you're in a, a noisy environment, um, it's very difficult to focus on one source. And I know eventually I will get uh, deaf because most of my family has that. So yeah, just doing it for myself and maybe hopefully some other people who will enjoy it. So there's more, you didn't pay attention. No conclusion yet. I've been going to China for a little while. This is 2014, 10 years ago. Uh, we started going, I mean, I started going with the hackerspace in San Francisco. Group of people that went there to visit factories and uh, obviously the manufacturing market and universities and all sorts of cool people. And I like this photo because it, it's an interesting overlap of communities, a bit like what's happening here, where you have people in academia, people in industry, and here is like, Founder of the hackerspace on the left. Beside him, there's the founder of Seed Studio. On the extreme right, there's uh, an MIT student who was in a, an MIT trip to China that was in parallel with this hackerspace trip to China. And there's me with the hat. Um, people often don't recognize me when I don't have my hat. It's kind of funny, um, which is good. I get discreet. So um, this trip kind of died with COVID. Obviously, it was kind of tricky to. Um, to travel to China, and I took over. And so in January, uh, we sent 10 students from MIT, but that was not sufficient from my perspective. So we co-founded this kind of um, 
uh, symposium, which is more open. Uh, and again, we do the, the factory visits, uh, the, also visit the electronic market. And there's all sorts of interesting things in this market, not just you can go and buy parts or find all sorts of incredible things. You can also find people who can make PCBs for you really fast, or you can find parts that are really rare or hard to find in the Western world. And this one is interesting because I got a PCB made in 24 hours to test a, a capacitive sensing chip just before I sent it to actually being made, uh, mass manufactured. And, um, and I got, well, I, I assembled it myself uh, with this high precision technique, which is using a toothpick, um, but it works. So basically it's a capacitive sensing chip that detects when you touch it. And so FAST has multiple scales. Uh, I mentioned that I use my uh, laser cutter to do that. And it's a special kind of laser. Don't play with CO2 lasers on metal, just as a warning. It, it, there are tricks to do it, but otherwise it's not a good idea. This is a special kind of laser. Um, we can talk about that afterward. But they are actually getting affordable. Now there's a, a, a factory that I visited that's making one for $1,000. So not only you can do flex PCBs, super high accurate, but you can also make rigid PCBs really fast. And interestingly, in the market, you can find people who engrave fake brands on uh, whatever you want, phones, uh, and then you can go with them uh, to talk to them and, and ask them if they can uh, engrave your PCBs for you. And if you pay, they don't care, they'll do it. Um, so they can do it in a few minutes. And on the other side, um, there are people who fix your laptops or your phones, and you can go with your PCB that you just uh, got made, and you can go get the parts in the market, and you can give all of them to the uh, phone repairman, and he will assemble them for you. So in one day, you get the whole thing made. Uh, actually a couple of hours. So there's an interesting magic there. But Shenzhen also has all those factories that I just mentioned, and it's actually extremely practical to be able to go there while they are building your device so that if there's a problem, well, you can debug it. So in this case, I was using a, a thermal camera to find um, a shot. Uh, I had a couple of shots with those uh, tiny microcontrollers that I just mentioned. And it's very simple to fix. You just put a bit of hair, hot air gun on it and it's done. Um, the, the other advantage is that uh, you can work with those um, uh, factory engineers to improve the design. They will have all the tricks because so many people made mistakes before. You can learn from them and get some uh, design improvements uh, thanks to them. So some people might be worried about building in China. Um, there's the cloning risks. Uh, I like to call it implicit open hardware. Um, <laughs> it's just a different perspective. And I have some arguments about it. So this case is uh, a quadcopter that was manufactured by Sid Studio. I visited them, that was in 2014, I think. And they were looking at a clone that had some pretty cool improvements on the cost because all manufacturing can be improved and those people, those companies that make clones, they, um, they, are, they make money because they can make things cheap. And so they have all sorts of really smart techniques and we can learn from them. So when they clone you, you can clone them and then they clone you again and clone them again. And that's actually what happened. <laughs> and this is a beautiful ecosystem, only possible in China. Maybe because of communism, I don't know. I heard it's an insult somewhere. So. That's one aspect. Now, on the other side, this is an actual industry and you can go to a shop. I don't know if there's any Chinese uh, reader speakers here, um, but there's a, a red translation that I added. Basically this shop, you can go with a device and you ask them, can you analyze it? And they'll do it for you and they will make the PCB for you and they can even extract the, the firmware for you. So I kind of like <laughs> this concept. I think hardware is open by construction. And I think this is the community where I'm the happiest. But I also think that the concept of open hardware should not even exist. It's the, it's the most obvious way. And I, I say that as a kind of hippie engineer because my motivation is I want to make cool hardware and share it. And that's just where I'm having fun. But there was someone earlier who was talking about investors putting all sorts of locks. And I think we can all find 
together some kind of arguments to counterattack those people because closed source doesn't make any sense, at least for hardware and also for software. The, it's, yeah, we will if reverse engineering, reverse engineering eventually. So I think there's this kind of weird tautology or uh, pleonasm. Uh, if it's free, nobody can steal it. And I think that's how I'd like to finish this talk. Uh, please come to see me if you want to talk about going to Shenzhen and see all of those crazy um, manufacturing hacks, but also the art scene is fucking amazing in Shenzhen. Come see in January, it's crazy. And if you have any questions, suggestions, uh, feel free to um, email me or just pay me a visit around here. And I'm looking for an internship. <laughs> just saying. <laughs>